Good evening, everyone. And uh, my name is Agnani Dattatraya. Work for uh, Capital One, an uh, awesome uh, technology <coughs> company. Also happens to be a bank. And this is uh, Satya. He also is my colleague. Works for Capital One Technology. Right. So uh, here we are to talk about. Uh, the resiliency of uh, applications that we run in cloud. And if you're wondering why we are two on the stage, is it because of the redundancy and the uh, high availability and active, active things that we are going on here? I want to make sure this uh, presentation is resilient, right? Uh, so uh, Cloud Detour is an uh, uh, internal tool uh, that we built at Capital One for uh, chaos engineering, right? So the chaos engineering, uh, so studying the obvious, is a discipline that uh, you would go and experiment or disrupt on a distributed system application to test the resiliency of the application when things go south, when things break in production, how does the application uh, react to it. Right? So that is this uh, uh, cloud resiliency. And our tool helps in uh, inducing uh, disrupt, uh, disruptions to the applications. I was in a local meetup the other day, and I was pitching this idea for a friend who runs the app. And he mentioned, oh, this is good, but we don't need this tool. Our app is uh, having this built-in capability of self-disruptions uh, and going down on its own. Right? <laughs> so, uh, However, moving on, here are the reasons why we need uh, cloud uh, disruption testing. So we have a lot of cool stuff about cloud, you know, but uh, you know, we realize that it is not managed by us. Um, so there is every chance that something can go wrong. You know, we have seen that log files have filled up uh, all the disk space and the servers crashed with a severity incident. Uh, instances can get rebooted. And when they reboot, all your processes, do they come fine? You know, we have found that some processes were not coming up fine because the system D didn't take care of properly. There can be humor error. And uh, network outages are possible. And uh, we have seen several software issues like memory leaks. And we run out of memory, and Docker containers get killed by the hard limit. Uh, we have high CPU issues. Is your application, you know, can it handle high CPU, some software, you know? So things like that, you know, how do we uh, predict them and uh, be prepared to you know, face them. So there are so many attributes of high availability and fault tolerance. To test an application for fault tolerance and isolation and automated recovery, um, you know, is it possible to test it in an automated way? You know, we can always log into a server and run a utility to consume high CPU. We can run a script to fill log spaces. Uh, we have done things like, um, terminating a uh, auto scaling instance manually go to the aws console and do that but in a large application uh, is it scalable and if you have a uh, it a department with the several applications and several instances of those applications how can we simulate these failures how can applications register themselves to these failures hey i want to be shut down at 11 am monday morning when there is a peak traffic and uh, we don't need a human to go and do that. So can we automatically subscribe to that? So this is what all chaos engineering discipline originated. Right. So uh, last year, when we started looking at this uh, topic, uh, and uh, none of us would miss, uh, Netflix has this uh, open source tool called Chaos Monkey that comes uh, into mind every time we talk about chaos engineering. And we explored Chaos Monkey for our internal use. It's, it's a pioneer. It's a novel idea from uh, Netflix. However, for our internal use, uh, it wouldn't work for us. For example, uh, at the time, it was using a database called SimpleDB in AWS, which was uh, uh, not great for us to use. It's not a NoSQL database. It's not a RDS. It's kind of its own domain hierarchy model type thing, which for a large enterprise like us wouldn't work very well. Right? And also, it was a Java web app, meaning you would have to run infrastructure to run your chaos engineering tool. And the reason we are speaking here is about serverless, right? How we are leveraging serverless technology on a developer tool that helps in chaos engineering testing. Right, and also the code base wouldn't work for us because uh, it wouldn't work behind a enterprise proxy type setting. And ours is all private VPCs, and uh, we had to change the code base a little bit to make that work behind enterprise proxy setting. Uh, and uh, 
well, that po at that point in time, uh, that project would uh, go and uh, disrupt only auto scaling groups uh, in uh, AWS cloud, right? So. Uh, we have our applications uh, taking advantage of number of AWS services, not only just AWS auto scaling groups, but also the individual EC2 machines, ELBs, RDS, ECS, Docker containers, and so on and so forth. So just going after attacking one type of resource wouldn't cover all our use cases, or wouldn't cover all our uh, scenarios. That's where we said, okay, we should do something that would work for us, which will go and disrupt many types of resources that we use and also run that efficiently, meaning uh, we don't have to run servers. We don't want to manage app servers. And also if you want to add a new application. In an enterprise like us, we will run like hundreds of applications. And each application need to have the flexibility to uh, choose their own disruption type for their uh, resource they use uh, for their app, and also choose their disruption schedule, uh, right? And these are the flexibilities we need. And that point, the Netflix Chaos Monkey was uh, still a web uh, Java app where uh, only it will go after auto scaling group and you'll have to give the ASG, ERN, AWS names at the property file level. If I have like thousand applications, like hundreds of applications, then you'd have to manage that, build that app, deploy it, all of that comes into play, which would not be operationally great for us to manage. So all of these things led us to develop our internal tool uh, called Cloud Detour, which is an internal name for us, which completely uses serverless technology. So before we go into how the tool itself works, what is, as an application owner, what is my experience, right? So as an application owner, I want to come and describe my application cloud resources in a simple JSON format like this. I would come and say my app, let's call it customer app, and I will have uh, so I will dis describe my uh, the app as to what resources it use. Here you can see I am using auto scaling group, and I'd say for auto scaling group, this is how I identify my auto scaling group, and what is the disruption type. I want to terminate one of the instances randomly from an auto scaling group every six hours, and I want to uh, send a notification to a certain person when such a such thing happens. And my app also uses uh, ECS Docker containers. And here is the cluster name, here is the service name, here is the disruption type, and uh, here is the disruption schedule. So as an application owner, I describe my app, I choose my disruption types, I choose my schedules, and then drop it in an S3 bucket, and from there onwards, bunch of serverless functions take over and start disrupting your app, right? So if the app is built resiliently, then the end user should not see any uh, degradation of service of the app. But if the app is not, then they would see the degradation. So earlier in the life cycle, rather than uh, catching all of these things in production at the worst possible time, you would have your app go through this in the earlier life cycle, so you would know all these things by that time. Right. So this is a very high level design flow for the uh, Cloud Detour application. Uh, like uh, number one, as an app owner, describe my app, choose my disruption types, and drop that in the S3 bucket. That creates an uh, event which will invoke the functions. So all the things that you see just uh, from the point when the app owner drops the file in the bucket are like a bunch of Lambda functions and uh, AWS managed services, right? So the Lambda function picks it up and registers that in the database and sends a notification to the uh, owner of the cloud resource, right? So in uh, in the more the right after lunch, we had a, another talk from Capital One Cloud Custodian, which is an open source uh, tool that makes sure when you are creating infrastructure, you have a tag saying who is the owner. In case we need to go after and find who is running the service, you need to have owner tag, and it takes advantage of such an uh, owner tag and sends a notification saying, hey, we received a, uh, a detour request to disrupt this resource. So you are identifying identified as owner of this application, do you approve this disruption? And the app owner says, yes, I do approve. And then uh, there is another uh, Lambda function that gets triggered, stores that state saying, yes, this is an approved for disruption, and creates a CloudWatch event, which is your scheduler. And we have Lambda functions for each resource disruption, for ASG, 
there is one function that goes and disrupts them. For EC2 machine, there is one. For ECS Docker container, there is one. For Elastic Cache, there is one. It gets scheduled, and those functions get invoked until start go and disrupt your application and sends notification as the disruption happens to the app owner saying the disruption is happening. Right? So moving on. If you look at the different features, these are all from AWS, and some of them are Linux-based uh, instance level. Uh, disruptions. So we have ASG, EC2, ECS, and Elastic Cache. We have implemented in our first MVP at the service level, managed service level, and at the instance level, we have implemented uh, CPU, memory, and I/O. So basically, each of these will be one lambda function. There are core lambda functions which take care of d database access, uh, things like approval workflow. So we need the approval workflow because we don't want people, developers, to submit for a production server and just start disrupting without the application business owner know, knowing about it. So since because of the owner tech compliance, we can accurately identify who is the owner and we have the approval that is registered in the database. So this is the detailed workflow. I will go through that. If you look at uh, RDS, you, know, you may be wondering why we are not using DynamoDB. Ideally, we would use DynamoDB for the best cost savings and um, with more better API access. Um, DynamoDB doesn't support uh, encryption at rest yet. It is uh, in AWS roadmap for the next quarter. So until then, uh, large corporates have regulations of not using services that have encryption support not available. So, uh, so, so we use RDS versus DynamoDB. <laughs> and we use SCS. And uh, if you look at here, we have a horizontal account and we have an LOB specific account. Uh, it is not unusual for large corporates have multiple accounts, uh, whatever number it is. So. Uh, we cannot be deploying this application in every account. Um, so we need uh, some kind of a uh, common workflow that is needed because emails are common, things like that. And one other thing, we are using Docker containers here for the approval API because uh, we don't have VPC private endpoint support for API Gateway yet. So we are deploying using ECS and uh, Docker containers using application load balancers. So that provides. Uh, a common access. When it is accessed from the horizontal account, anybody from the company will be able to access this approval API. We can be using the common uh, email system. So when we see here, so we have VPC level functions and non-VPC level functions. Uh, because VPC level functions are more subnet based, and uh, you know, if you run out of IPs on the subnet, then your Lambda functions may not execute. So to avoid that, we try to minimize the number of VPC functions. So that makes the deployment easier. So in this case, all the RDS access is through uh, VPC function. So any, any instance from any VPC will be able to call through the APIs of Lambda uh, to insert data into the RDS database. So this is at the VPC level. The central RDS database stores. So the approval tokens. Basically, if you approve, you know, we, we, we exchange a token, the EU, EU ID for the approval both and decline. Also, to ensure that the person who actually registered is what getting approved. So we exchange tokens. So the central RDS database takes care of storing these things. And the Docker container is a simple Go API uh, that says it receives the token and passes it along to Lambda functions. All the application uh, logic is abstracted within uh, about, we have about 16 Lambda functions doing with uh, one function each for each of these uh, disruption types. So we have been using uh, all the triggers for the Lambda functions. Basically, the initial trigger gets started from the S3. And once uh, it reviews the request, and if it is valid, it passes on to the central through an SNS relay. So that sends the email from the central account and also registers an approval and decline tokens which once the approver approves this API, this API passes the right token, then this Lambda function identifies that, hey, this is for approval, or this is for decline, or it's an invalid. Once this finds that it's an approval, it resumes the workflow by sending another SNS notification. We have cross-account permissions enabled between the SNS topics <coughs> and Lambda functions, whichever need cross-account. And once this approval function uh, identifies that this is for approval token, it creates a CloudWatch event. And the CloudWatch event is matches with what you saw in the JSON file, whether it's a rate of 360 minutes or it's a cron tab, say every Monday, 11 o'clock. So that each of this function, at that time, 
um, these functions are independently operated by the CloudWatch events. So if you no longer need that, you again come back to the JSON file, there's an unregistered workflow, and it actually um, does the opposite of what you do, and the database gets marked as deleted, and uh, um, you get an email for all of this workflow, and once it is deleted, uh, it's also kept, I mean, it marked and deleted, and you have audit history of what has been di disrupted for every disruption, we record that. So this provides a history of everything happened, and this is currently not at open source, but we are working on MVP and the minimal functions to get it to open source. Once that is available, like Cloud Custodian, it will be available through our GitHub site. All right. So uh, just a couple a couple uh, thoughts before uh, we close out. Uh, and uh, like, like you can see, like when we have the API gateway private VPC endpoints, then it can get simpler. We don't have to run a Docker container to make the API workflow there. And when we have the uh, DynamoDB uh, encryption uh, available uh, for the VPC uh, services, then uh, uh, we could uh, have a DynamoDB instead of uh, uh, RDS. And uh, also, some of the pain points we have in uh, Lambda functions is the dashboard itself. We cannot group a bunch of Lambda functions under one app in AWS. So those are some things uh, which can get better. And we felt uh, some of the things what uh, Patrick in the morning uh, ran into and the other gentlemen uh, ran into, such as like you know temp uh, stores data uh, as part of Lambda function. So those are some things that we also learned as we uh, went through this journey. And regarding the serverless, uh, uh, the cost comparison was uh, excluding the personal, operational personnel. Just for the servers, we calculated if you were to use DynamoDB and the cost of running with your own servers uh, in AWS is $800 versus $6 for this model. Yeah. Yeah. All right, that's about it. Thank you.